Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this talk, From Danzig to the Jewish Museum, Precious Survival and the Legacy of Jewish Ceremonial Art. This lecture is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, Afterlives, Recovering the Lost Stories of Looted Art on view at the Jewish Museum through January 9th, 2022. And we encourage you to visit if you are able to do so. The Lines of Distinction lecture has been endowed by Barbara and Benjamin Zucker in memory of Lottie and Charles Zucker and by the late William W. Halo, the late Susan Halo Kalem and the late Ruth Halo Landman in memory of Dr. Gertrude Halo. Now I would like to briefly introduce our speaker. Abigail Rappaport is Curator of Judaica at the Jewish Museum. Rappaport joined the staff in January 2020 and held previous roles at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Morgan Library and Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Israel Museum. She is completing her doctorate in medieval art history at the University of Pennsylvania, where she also received an MA in art history with a focus on 17th century Dutch art. Her dissertation examines iconography related to the Mosaic Covenant within Jewish and Christian communities in the Middle Ages, especially across illuminated manuscripts and metalwork. It is my pleasure to welcome her to begin this talk. Thank you for the thoughtful introduction, Jenna. Hi, everyone. I'm Abdel Rappaport, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you today two remarkable collections of Jewish ceremonial objects, also called Judaica, in the museum's collection. We will learn how both collections separately arrived at the Jewish Museum, in one case, just escaping Nazi destruction, and in the other case, after the horror of the war. We will first look at the collection from the Jewish community of Danzig, now Gdansk in Poland, that came to the Jewish Museum in 1939. And then we will turn our attention to the objects once belonging Jews that were allocated to the museum by the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Incorporated, called JCR. Selections of objects from these two collections are currently on display in the Jewish Museum's exhibition, Afterlives, Recovering the Lost Stories of Looted Art, curated by Darcy Alexander and Sam Sakharov. The show is on view until January 9th, 2022. To situate us within the exhibition space, both collections of Judaica are peeking through this window, front and center of the exhibition. It is a jewel box within the show. At first glance, the pieces in the various sections of the gallery may look similar to one another. We can see a lot of shining silver, some objects with wear and tear, others in remarkably good shape. Yet the two collections tell distinct stories and each object tells a different story, some of which we know, others which we do not know. Looking at the center of the gallery, we see selections of objects that came to the museum from the Jewish community of Danzig in 1939. Danzig was a unique city with diverse cultural and political identities, which had a long history of being under Polish and German rule at different points. Its distinctive location can help us understand the dual allegiances of the city. That is, Danzig was bordered on the west and south by the Polish corridor and to the east by East Prussia. Its position on the Baltic gave it ready access and ability to trade widely with Germany, as well as the Netherlands, Scandinavia, the Baltic States, and Russia and its position on the Vistula River allowed goods from inland Poland to reach the sea and vice versa. It was a major commercial port in Poland, serving as an outlet for Polish goods, especially for timber and grain, as well as being a cultural outpost of Germany. After World War I, Danzig became a free city, known as the Free City of Danzig, an independent city-state under the protection of the League of Nations. In terms of the Jewish community, while Jews were not allowed to live in Danzig for centuries, as was the case throughout Europe, in the 20th century, 
Jews increasingly immigrated to Danzig. Because Danzig was a free port city, Jewish refugees from Poland and Russia sought refuge there. The community, which was comprised mainly of German Jews, as well as Eastern European Jews from Poland and Russia, hit its peak in 1937, numbering 12,000 Jews, and just two years before the precious objects came to New York and the Nazis invaded. The community became a flourishing one, and members of the Jewish community contributed greatly to the commercial life of the city. The Jews of Danzig created a vibrant religious, cultural, and social life there, with the synagogue itself giving us a glimpse into the community. This majestic synagogue was built between 1885 and 1887. It was designed by the prominent architecture firm in Berlin, Enda and Bokman. It was designed as a neo-Renaissance structure with a prominent dome that soared 177 feet into the air. These features made the synagogue a landmark of the city, as we can see in the cityscape on our right. The building also would have shown at night with a lantern, rendering its presence even more visible. Several synagogues have been set up in Danzig in the 19th century, from the communities of Altschotlin, Weinberg, Longfer, Danzig Breitzgas, and Danzig Matenbuden. Eventually, the Great Synagogue, a reform one, became the main synagogue that could accommodate the thriving population in the 20th century. The interior of the Great Synagogue of Danzig was just as lavish as its exterior. Large chandeliers hung in the main chamber, which itself could accommodate more than 2,000 people. There was an organ with space for a 100 person choir. It was the key cultural center for the Jewish communities in Danzig. The synagogue was not only impressive within the city, but it was well known globally too, and attracted people from all over the world for ceremonies, lectures, and concerts. There was life, liturgy, and music emanating from the synagogue. This was all to be destroyed when the Nazis marked the great synagogue for destruction and soon after obliterated it. Viscerally feeling the imminent destruction of their community, members of the Danzig Jewish community gathered together all the ceremonial objects of the great synagogue. And with the help of the American Joint Distribution Committee, they prepared the shipment of their precious objects to New York for safekeeping. The synagogue's archives were sent to Jerusalem and its library was sent to Vilnius. To make this happen, they negotiated the sale of their property, including their great synagogue and Jewish cemetery to fund the emigration of those who could still leave. This is the police permit indicating that the ritual items could be shipped to the United States pending that the proceeds be used for the emigration of the Jewish community of Danzig. Just a month later, the community prepared an inventory, which you can see here on this screen. It enumerated the ceremonial objects to be shipped to New York for safekeeping. The understanding was that if the Jewish community returned to Danzig in 15 years, the objects would be returned. If not, they would stay at the Jewish Museum as educational resources to teach and inspire the world. Barely a month before the German army marched into Danzig in 1939, on July 26, 10 enormous crates with hundreds of ceremonial objects, a variety of textiles, books, Torah scrolls, and memorabilia, arrived at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York on 122nd Street and Broadway, which was then home to the Jewish Museum. The hope was that the community would return, but they did not. 15 years later, in 1954, the pieces were accessioned into the collection where they have remained until today. Almost immediately, instead of being stored away and hidden from view, the pieces were displayed in empty dormitory rooms of the seminary where visitors could learn about the objects that were treasured by the Danzig Jewish community. 
five years after the objects arrived at the Jewish Museum and five years since the Nazi occupation of Danzig, the collection was displayed in the storefront window of Scribner's bookstore on Fifth Avenue. We can read this announcement of the Scribner's display of the collection in this newspaper clipping from the time in which we can also see a photograph of the former faculty member of the seminary, Professor Max Arst on our left and Rabbi Bertold Voithaler on our right who formerly lived in Danzig. In 1980, the Jewish Museum organized a major exhibition called Danzig 1939, Treasures of a Destroyed Community with a thorough catalog accompanying the show that included extensive research on the collection. The exhibition traveled to multiple institutions in the United States, as well as to Israel and Germany from 1980 to 1982. Before it came to New York, the Donzin collection was originally housed in the Great Synagogue, the beautiful synagogue we saw earlier and which we see here again on the screen. The Donzig collection is comprised of three parts. The first category is ceremonial objects used by the Great Synagogue, which included objects from the older synagogues of the region. The second category is objects never inventoried before 1939. They are most likely heirlooms from homes of the Jewish community members who added their precious possessions to the Zonadzig Synagogue collection to be sent for safekeeping to New York. They too were anxious about the impending destruction of their Jewish community and material culture. The largest portion of the collection was donated to the Great Synagogue by the private collector, Lesser Gilczynski. Mr. Gilczynski was born in Wrocław, Poland in 1830. He settled in Danzig in 1860, and not long after he became a prosperous grain merchant at which point he started to become quite active in Danzig's civic life and traveled extensively throughout Europe. He was a prominent art collector, a connoisseur, and art advisor to the German Emperor Wilhelm II. And he served on the board of directors of the Great Synagogue from 1884 until his death in 1910. He was praised for his singular generosity. And in this photograph, we can see Mr. Gilczynski decorated with honorary badges. Specifically, in 1905, Emperor Wilhelm II presented him with the Order of the Red Eagle and the Order of the Crown. Much of what we know about Mr. Gilczynski is through his granddaughter, Rita Pallister, who after reading about the collection coming to the Jewish Museum, came knocking on the museum's doors where she saw the treasures of her grandfather. She then enthusiastically provided the museum with newspaper articles about her grandfather to give the museum more information on her grandfather. Mr. Gilczynski's house itself became a museum and a sight to see. Seven rooms were filled with treasures of his collection, which ranged from Chinese porcelain to locally produced furniture, to paintings and prints, and to Jewish ceremonial art. Mr. Gilczynski donated the Jewish ceremonial objects of his collection to the Great Synagogue on his 75th birthday on January 10th, 1904, with the following statement. I, Lesser Gilczynski, bequeath my collection of ancient and ceremonial objects to the synagogue and Jewish community of Danzig as their property for all time. The collection shall be known as the Gilginski donation, always to be exhibited in a separate and appropriate room, carefully preserved and open, free to all. This document shall remain forever in this room with the collection as an internal remembrance. That room became known as the Gilginski Zimmer or the Gilginski Room in English, which became one of the first formal Jewish museums in the world and Mr. Gudzinski himself was one of the earliest collectors of Judaica. Though we can't reconstruct a full picture of Mr. Gudzinski, we can learn about his taste through some of the objects on display. His pieces are the highest quality objects of the Danzig collection. 
we can understand his objects as both personal and communal. He selected the pieces, displayed and cherished those objects in his home, and then donated his possessions to the great synagogue for the Jewish community of Danzig to enjoy. Mr. Kaczynski also included special objects about his own family in his gift to the synagogue. We can see some of these objects on display in the exhibition. For example, these delicate plaques honor the life of Mr. Gilginski's mother, Leah, and his father, Michael. In Mr. Gilginski's own handwriting, he memorializes the life of his mother and father, including documenting their respective birth dates, places, and years of death. With hooks at the top of each one, we can picture that these small objects could have hung in his home. Another personal item included in his gift to the synagogue was this prior book published in Prague, which was designated for rail travelers journeying across the sea. On the same page as the prayer, Mr. Gilginski wrote that the book belonged to his father and mother. When stories of these objects are mostly lost, such humble notes speak volumes. Through seeing three works on display, we'll get a glimpse into his taste for rare pieces of Judaica. This splendid bridal belt and pouch, which was made in Germany in the 18th or 19th century, would have been used in the exchange of gifts between bride and groom. This was a Jewish custom that emerged in German regions in the Middle Ages, that the bride and groom would exchange lavish belts the eve before their wedding and they would wear the special belts in the wedding ceremony itself. We can see the custom in this painting by Moritz Oppenheim that depicts a Jewish wedding with bride and groom dressed in their gilded belts. And there was even a custom to hook together the belts of the bride and groom after the ceremony to symbolize their eternal unity in marriage. Most surviving examples look like this with the belts being made out of metal Yet this special example owned by Mr. Gilginski is not only adorned with gilded metallic appliques throughout, it is made out of silk, which is quite rare for the surviving marriage belts. The piece itself is a personal item representing an intimate exchange of marital gifts. Its decoration is romantic, joyful, and full of life. The silk brocade shows a profusion of flowers in hues of green, pink and cream white that embellish the belt and pouch. The elegant and subtle contrasts of the beehive-like rosettes with the textured lines of the material itself enlivens the belt, infusing it with energy. There's of course a lot we don't know about it. We don't know whose wedding it was used for or if this silk cloth was used for another item prior to its formation as a marriage belt. Yet we do know that Mr. Gilginski inquired the director of the Jewish Museum of Frankfurt about the German Jewish custom of brides and grooms exchanging belts decorated with gold. The correspondence gives us some insight into Mr. Gilginski as a collector, carefully selecting the items to go into his collection and researching the distinct Jewish customs. We can imagine it then being cherished by the Danzig Jewish community. At first glance, this Seder plate, which was made between the 18th and 19th centuries in Eastern Galicia or Western Ukraine, is quite unusual in its cake-like form. It is not simply a plate with six sections for the symbolic foods of Passover. Rather, the three-in-one Seder plate is designed to hold the ritual foods, the cup of Elijah, and plates for pieces of matzah. This tiered cedar plate is also rare in its dynamic use of materials and motifs. Most surviving types are rendered metal, yet this one is made in wood and brass, painted with splashes of color throughout, and is embellished with patterned cloth that peeks through the object. All around this crown structure, we see rampant lions, flanking the blessings over the ceremonial foods. Their mouths are open, 
almost biting into the blessings, which is meaningful from a ritual perspective because the whole idea of the Seder is participation in this experience of the Exodus. These rampant lions are also present throughout Jewish material culture, especially displayed in synagogues, flanking the Ten Commandments on top of the Torah Ark. As we can see here on the left in this Torah Ark on display at the Jewish Museum. We can even see this lion motif in the Great Synagogue of Danzig, in the sanctuary just above the Torah Ark on our right. The motif on the tiered Seder plate would have been recognizable to the community, a friendly reminder of the lions in the community sanctuary. Often the crown emblem is present too within the synagogue, as can be seen in this decalogue on our left from the Danzig Jewish community, now in the Jewish Museum's collection. The decalogue was originally in the Shotland synagogue before the synagogues merged into the great synagogue. We can picture the tiered plate as a centerpiece of the Seder table in Mr. Gilchinsky's home, Marvel deck. Yet we can also picture the piece with its flanking lions and crowns that echo the synagogue itself being enjoyed communally too. Moving from one crown-like form to a crown for a Torah, this Torah crown is also a rare work of its type in terms of its material. Most surviving Torah crowns from the region and period are rendered in silver, but this one is made in copper. Though it is in copper, which is a less expensive material than silver, we can see from the ornate craftsmanship of the object that the community in Italy who originally used the crown made every effort to make this piece sparkle. The scroll-like decoration interspersed with flowers would have been in vogue at a time throughout Europe. Aside from being a work of art, the object was importantly used for ritual purposes. At one point, this crown would have adorned a Torah. Specifically, it would have covered the two staves of the Torah scroll, which was unfurled for reading. Torah ornaments form the most significant part of the Danzig collection in terms of the type of ritual object. There are poignant communal and personal aspects which we know about this Torah crown. For example, the Hebrew inscription on the Torah crown tells us that it was originally dedicated to a synagogue in Italy by the heirs of a Zalman from Balzano, a city in Italy. In addition to its far-reaching communal and personal provenance, the Torah crown shows Mr. Gilginski's range of interests and travels. The piece itself, as we saw, is from Italy, and its fashion also reflects Italian craftsmanship of the period. A handwritten note by Mr. Gilginski was originally attached to a brown velvet stand for this Torah crown. The note indicated that this crown was lost in a pogrom in Russia and found again. Many of these objects, like this one, were passed from different hands and survived war and persecution. Such stories, even if fragmented, make us realize the sheer survival of such pieces is nearly miraculous. The next few objects we will see are special pieces that have voices. That is, they come with inscriptions left by the individual or community who own the piece. These two objects on the screen both originally come from a synagogue in Matenbuden a district in Danzig, which was where an Orthodox synagogue did remain open, even after the Great Synagogue was established, mainly for the Eastern European Orthodox minority in Danzig. This Grand Kiddush goblet was donated to the community leader, Itzik Goldstein, in recognition of his charitable works for the Matenbuten Synagogue. An engraving on the goblet, enlarged on our left, depicts the interior of the synagogue, erected in 1838, largely through Goldstein's efforts. We also learn about the society's concerns and communal activities through pieces on display, like this alms dish used for collecting money for those in need. It is inscribed with a Hebrew inscription set within an open book, which reads, 
Society for the Maintenance of Books of the Holy Congregation of Matzenbuten in Danzig. Both of these alms containers belong to women's societies of Danzig, though used for similar purposes to collect money for those in need, organized by women in the community. Each container is rendered in a different fashion, personalizing the different societies. The handles on each one remind us that these objects were held, touched, and used. This elegant mezuzah on our left, an object that customarily hangs on a doorpost of a Jewish home, has a little mark inside that says T.S. Cohn. Perhaps he owned the mezuzah, and perhaps the mezuzah was a fixture in his home. This splendid prayer book cover with a prayer book inside on our right contains an inscription in Judeo-German, a dialect spoken by German Jews. The inscription reads, this is a silver cover from my esteemed friend that indicates the year in which it was given to me as a tribute in my honor by Samuel Ben Wolf Noah, 5597 or 1837 in the Gregorian calendar, written by Hirsch Duretsky, Cantor and Breslau. Another inscription written in Hebrew is a joyful exclamation. Rejoice children of Yaakov, his hosts shout out, Fill your stomach with good wine. Do not distance yourself from pleasures of the spirit. Because of the joy and gladness, stay near. These are just some of the mottos left to us that express the happy occasions on which items like this one may have been used and enjoyed. Nothing remains of the great synagogue today, aside from this bronze model of the synagogue, which was unveiled a few years ago by the mayor and head of the Jewish community. The Danzig collection is unique, not only in its superb pieces of Judaica, but it is rare that we can piece together one community through objects that came to us. It is unbelievable and heartbreaking that the Danzig community, sensing imminent destruction, shipped the items for safekeeping until they could return, which they never did. The objects allocated from the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Organization to the Jewish Museum tell a different story. To describe the full history of the JCR, including the seeds that planted the organization, would take an entire lecture and more. In sum, in 1949, the JCR was officially recognized by the United States government as the agency in charge of organizing and distributing Jewish cultural property that had been plundered by the Nazis and that remained in Germany after World War II. This material, which included Jewish owned books and ceremonial objects, had been recovered in the American zone of Germany, centralized in Offenbach and later in Wiesbaden. It goes without saying that much of the material was deemed airless because of the extent of the Nazi destruction that is the original owners or heirs of the precious possessions could not be located. The job of JCR was to be responsible for the enormous amounts of orphaned objects and to accomplish the difficult and complex task of finding homes, specifically Jewish institutions around the world for the hundreds of thousands of objects. The goal of the JCR was not about getting back what was lost, the lives of European Jewry could not be revived, but to distribute the property to vibrant communities where the pieces would be used and seen. Prominent Jewish intellectuals were the leaders of the organization. Among them were the notable Jewish historian, Salo Baron, who was executive director and founder. Another distinguished Jewish historian, Joshua Starr, and later the political philosopher, Hannah Arendt served as executive secretaries. In August of 1949, the JCR delivered 83 crates containing more than 3,000 ceremonial objects to the Jewish Museum in New York. The museum itself served as a temporary depot for ceremonial objects from 1949 to 1952 
to then be distributed throughout the world, including the Americas, Great Britain, and South Africa. At the Jewish Museum, which by that point had moved to the Wardburg Mansion, this squash court and cellar room acted as a storage site for the ceremonial objects that entered the United States. We can see a snapshot of the museum as a temporary storage depot in this image on the screen. Approximately 220 of the objects that arrived at the museum entered its permanent collection. We have letters documenting correspondence between the leaders of the organization and the Jewish Museum. For example, on the screen here, we can see a letter by Hannah Arendt to the then director of the Jewish Museum, Stephen Kaiser. She reports that the museum received the 83 crates of the ceremonial objects, and she attached extensive reports by Mordechai Narkis, the then director of the Betzalel Museum in Israel, and the renowned curator and art historian who accomplished a difficult task of selecting and sorting the material at Wiesbaden. The Jewish Museum's then director and pioneer curator in Jewish art, Stephen Kaiser, and the research fellow and art historian, Guido Schoenberger, were asked to join the allocation committee of the JCR for determining how these objects were to be distributed. This section of the exhibition that you see on our right is modeled based on the storeroom that these objects were first housed in more than seven decades ago at the Jewish Museum. The red outline in the historical photograph on our left shows the particular sections of Judaica, which were used as a model for the display in the exhibition. These upper four cases show at the top left and across spice containers, kiddush cups, and alm containers and our lower left and across, Torah shields and Torah finials. Though we see several examples of the same ritual type of object, each one is unique and tells a different history of use and possession, even if we don't know that story. On a basic level, the pieces themselves come from a range of periods and regions representing different Jewish customs and practices. They exhibit distinct styles and motifs, we can see this simply from comparing just these two pairs of finials on display. The conditions also vary, which we can see here too. Some pieces show great wear and tear, while others seem like they're in almost pristine condition. Yet all these objects traveled great distances and survived centuries of Jewish persecutions. Some give us a clue into their past owner and some even tell more than one story of past use and ownership. Zooming in on this one in particular, this is a silver spice container used for the Havdalah ceremony that concludes the Sabbath and ushers in the new week. It was made in Frankfurt in 1550, and it's one of the earliest of its kind known today. The spice container is fashioned like a miniature Gothic tower with two rose windows and soaring spires at the top, giving the object this castle-like impression. The piece exemplifies how Jewish ceremonial objects were rendered with exquisite and meticulously detailed artistry. On the back of the spice tower, it says, Rachala, daughter of Eliezer Dayan, with the year 5411, which translates to 1650, 1651, in the Gregorian calendar. In around 1650 or 1651, Rachela, the daughter of Eliezer Dayan, added her name, possibly at the time of a repair. At an unknown date, the container then went to the synagogue of Friedberg, Germany, where it was used until 1938 or 1939, when the Friedberg Jewish community donated the Spice Tower to the Jewish Museum of Frankfurt where it went during World War II. The JCR recovered it after the war and gave it to the Jewish Museum in New York. You may notice a tag on some of the objects we just saw. These aluminum little identification tags inscribed with a Jewish star and the initials for the JCR were created by the organization and attached to the airless possessions. The tags live with these objects and we can think about them as a reminder of the people and communities 
who once owned their precious possessions. This section of the JCR display in the exhibition shows objects which still feature the tags on them. A tag that fell off one of the objects is in the display as well, which we can see enlarged here on the screen. We can see the tags on these items, for example, in the exhibition. But not all the objects are shiny silver. These pieces are more humble objects. They are wooden utensils for rolling and cutting matzah on Passover, which is the method for making matzah until the 20th century introduction of machine production. These Hanukkah lamps in this section, which also feature the tag, demonstrate the wear and tear of these objects and even their travels. Specifically, in the lamp on the right, we can still see straw tucked between the sockets of the lamp, which is left over from the packaging material when this piece came to New York. Both pieces on the screen are fragments from larger lamps that would have had bases holding them up. In some cases, the object comes down in pieces, as we can see here clearly with this Torah pointer that's split in half. We've seen small objects, objects in different conditions, humble objects. In the same gallery space, just adjacent from the JCR display and across from the Danzig display at the center, we can see grand objects owned by prominent Jewish families. We'll focus on the splendid lamp hanging from the ceiling, but we can also see a luxurious box for valuables that looks like a treasure chest just below the lamp. We can catch a glimpse of this medallion just next to the lavish box in the case right next to it. These items can also be identified in the historical photograph of the objects from the JCR at the Jewish Museum in the image we saw earlier. Focusing on this ornate silver lamp, it was made by the renowned silversmith, Johann Valentin Schuler, who worked in the latter half of the 17th to the 18th century. He is well known for producing high quality Judaica in Frankfurt. The lamp was originally used for the Sabbath in a Jewish home, but it was later modified to be used in a synagogue as a ner tamid, an eternal light. The form of the lamp in the shape of a star for the wicks and oil with the basin just below was used for centuries prior to this lamp. Even if the form is traditional, the craftsmanship represents the style of the age, specifically the Baroque style of ornamental and luxurious details. We can imagine that when it would have been lit in the Rothschild household, the flickering candles would have cast a dance of light and shadow reflecting from the silver. The two flags held aloft by the lion tell us through a dedicatory inscription that the lamp was donated by Matilda Freifau von Rothschild in memory of her husband, Shimon, known as Wilhelm Baron von Rothschild who was the last head of the Frankfurt branch of the Rothschild family. By the middle of the 19th century, we know that this lamp was a treasured heirloom in the Rothschild family. These are just a few of the objects that were airless after the war. By the end of the JCR's long and complicated process, the organization had distributed thousands of ceremonial objects and hundreds of thousands of books to Jewish institutions around the world. In both collections, whether the story of the Jewish community in Danzig having foresight to save their collection, or in the case of the incredible efforts by the JCR and the government to allocate these orphaned objects to different homes, the Jewish Museum is a guardian of these objects. It is our job to continue to tell these stories to sustain the legacy of these objects and people. To conclude, I would like to thank the generous funders of this lecture, its organizers, especially Nellie Silagi Benedict and Jenna Weiss. And thank you to the decades of curators, researchers, catalogers, and conservators who have worked so hard on the special objects we saw today.
Thank you all for participating and joining the Jewish Museum Lecture on this fifth evening of Hanukkah.